Okay. <laughs> well, it, it, since we're a relatively small group, I'd love to start just to go around and have people say who they are and just quickly what you work on, because I'm intrigued with um, that. So. Sure. My name is Mark Colbury. Um, I'm in the Department of Comparative Literature. I work on uh, the notion of literary production in 20th century France as it relates to the concept of economic and socio-political production. So, Iftikhar Dadi, I'm faculty in the history of art and I work on modern art. Uh, I'm Lara Cusco, I'm in the history of art department. I'm working currently on the refigurations of historical violence in Turkey in contemporary art and visual culture. I'm Fouad Maki, I'm in the Department of um, Sociology. It's one of the things I work on and I'm interested in is questions of enclosures. Um, Chris Berardino, I'm in the Department of uh, English. Um, I'm currently working on trying to re-theorize uh, modernism in terms of uh, leftists and labor influences and uh, yeah, trying to take it back from the fascists, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gary. I'm in development sociology and my work uh, focuses on um, poultry workers in Georgia and um, different forms of organizing both within and outside of the uh, I'm Divya. I'm in uh, development sociology as well and I work on agrarian politics in India. My name is Maggie, and I'm in information science. And I, most of my fieldwork has been in Cambodia, and I've looked at a lot of different forms of digital labor in Phnom Penh um, around online buying and selling, and then also around archiving. Hi, I'm Hillary. I'm in development sociology, and I work on um, land and women's rights movements in Myanmar. I'm Katie. I'm also in development sociology, and um, I'm working on labor relations in the shrimp industry in Thailand and Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, I'm Carl. I'm in the French program, um, and yeah, I'm interested in social theory and, and Marxism in, in the French context. Really. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, great. This is a rare combination. This is actually <laughs> the two halves of my head in some ways. Uh, and sometimes I feel like there's, in the audience there's only one half of that. So um, <laughs> let me... Uh, let, let me start by saying um, two things, really, kind of what the overall project is, and then maybe a reminder of the argument of these two essays uh, that you may have sampled or scanned or something else or whatever. Uh, so the, the, it's a book. The book actually got started before Noise Uprising was ever imagined, and then Noise Uprising kind of interrupted it and uh, now I'm returning to the book that I had imagined. That's why one of the two essays was published in 2007 and I was sort of moving along. I thought that is the first chapter of the book. Um, and it really starts from a contradiction that I feel like I've lived with. It goes back to in many ways being involved of now 25 years of attempting to get a graduate teachers union at Yale. Uh, the struggles, you know, one of the great things of working at Yale is it has been an education in uh, unionism in higher education and a remarkable one across the um, the three different locals, which are all uh, locals of Unite here, and have brought together academic workers with clerical and technical workers and the service and maintenance workers. And out of that also, I was involved in the mid-90s, a great moment now in retrospect of the kind of new vision, really the first new leadership in the AFL-CIO since the beginning. Uh, when Sweeney and the sign of shift from the, the auto workers being the center of the labor movement to service workers and SEIU being that. And a tremendous amount of um, uh, 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 optimism in the mid-90s which led to the organization with something called Sausage. 
scholars, art, artists, and writers for social justice, which was actually, uh, and which met for a number of conferences and things to bring together academics and writers and that new labor movement. And in some sense, this book, I had finished The Cultural Front in 97, that that came out of, and in some sense, this book was an attempt to think through what was happening in all of that, and it's taken 20 years. This is kind of a long-term project. But the contradiction at the heart of it is, on the one hand, a real sense of the imaginative, both political and cultural, crisis of labor, of the labor movement, of the idea of work, of workers at the close of what might be seen in retrospect as the workers' century. Somehow this seemed to be an old-fashioned, no longer relevant concept. On the other hand, we saw the continued and even expanded domination of daily life everywhere around the world by the imperative to make a living. Even as jobs disappeared, work didn't disappear in an increasingly precarious and contingent and temporary and all those other words, vulnerable world. So this kind of weird centrality of something called work and yet it's an imaginative crisis. And so it did seem to me that we needed a critical theory of living and making a living under capitalist imperatives. Um, oddly, the most sustained tradition of critical theory had a richer theory of the circulation and accumulation of capital than it had a, a, a account of the circulation and accumulation of labor. Uh, and so that, and then I began teaching an undergraduate course. This was also a shift in myself. I had for many years taught formation of modern American culture, a kind of 20th century interdisciplinary course that you can see also in the cultural front. And so I tried to think, wow, could I get out of that? I put together a course called Work in Daily Life in Global Capitalism that I still teach on and off, which was an attempt to do a survey course of changes in work and workers' movements around the world since the beginning of the 20th century. Kind of crazily ambitious, but then hell, there are people in art, you know, people who do entire regions of the world over 500 years and uh, as a survey course. So... Um, and so that's what the title of this is, the working title has always been The Accumulation of Labor. Uh, in recent, when I've gone back to it, Wageless Life has, partly because of the relative success of that essay, I kind of pushes in and thinks, well, maybe that should be the title of it. But these two essays are right now the first and third chapters of a book that's probably about three quarters written, because I really have been working on this for a long time. And I think they give a good example of the mode of composition. The kind of the idea of this are theoretical clarification of key concepts based on reflections on the history of the ways work, labor and workers have been represented over the last 150 years. I feel like, I don't know whether you feel like, it's a more relaxed writing style than the noisy and syncopated collage of noise uprising. There I just felt like there were so many different names and musics and that the sentences kind of are just crushed together. And if it works, it might work as kind of one of those weird collages. When I write this, it feels much more relaxed. It feels like this is um, maybe partly because that was a book where I was trying to learn new stuff and put that together. This feels like more reflection on years of working and thinking about these issues. Um, so the two essays, Representing Global Labor, has three parts. It's still imagined as a kind of opening. Uh, an argument of how we came to have an imagination of global labor, how workers of the world could have emerged as a kind of imaginative category through, on the one hand, a new abstraction of labor and a new imagination of the international. And then I turn to, again, one of the things, I don't know whether this will still be at the beginning. When I began, these seemed to be the end of the 20th century's version of what global labor looked like. On the one hand, Salgado's great collection of photographs, workers, and on the other hand, the World Bank decided they needed to do a study of workers in an integrating world. Um, 
And then an argument, and again, that part, well, who knows what that'll look like in the book. And then the third part, really, an argument about that imaginative crisis, how labor is in some ways both too rich a metaphor with too many connotations for us, and yet, on the other hand, too abstract a concept. Uh, and so we could talk about any of that. And then Wageless Life also has, I guess, three parts, maybe not. Uh... The opening argument, which I think is a key one about reversing the theoretical priority of wage labor, to basically start that in the critical theory of capitalism doesn't begin with wage labor. Uh, and then a history of the ways in which wageless life has been imagined over the last years. And it's one, on the one hand, there's an account of how unemployment has been, and the way in which that was divided in the zones of the world economy. And that unemployment became the way in which a variety of social democratic uh, politics and labor apparatuses understood wageless life and that the informal sector, as it was originally called, is now the full informal economy, became the way in which to understand in what was to call the third world for a number of uh, decades there. Uh, with a kind of sideways glance, you can see the relation to it, to what ha were kind of the taken-for-granted concepts in the Marxist tradition for these two elements. On the one hand, the reserve army of labor, uh, which we'd inherited from the 19th century, and another term we'd inherited from the 19th century, the lumpen proletariat. So that's kind of what these are. Both pieces, I didn't write this, I thought, don't apologize, but anyway, both pieces, when I read them, don't have conclusions, and I think that's partly, be, or there is a kind of, you know, slogan at the end, you know, workers of the world unite, or whatever, but that's partly because I think both of these were meant to be kind of essays to, that the next bit is not a conclusion, but the next chapter. Uh, and I might say, the one I've now, and there are all lots of different ones I can talk about them, but I'll talk about the one that is probably immediately after Wageless Life, which I spent most of the summer working on, and came out of the working group's project on life and death last year. And I became quite interested in one of the key concepts in Marxism, which is totally untheorized, which is living labor. And what does it mean? What is the intersection between life and labor, uh, particularly in a moment when any number of uh, people, to think of Donna Haraway, but there are other names who have actually talked about the way in life itself has become a kind of commodity, uh, in which there are a number of people who say that value is no longer dependent on the labor power in products, but kind of life in all of that. And so there's an essay that's really an attempt to think through what uh, the relation between life and labor is. Uh, that one's not finished. It's taken me back to the fascinating group of Marxist geneticists, in, particularly in Britain in the 1930s, uh, and the attempt to kind of think through again the relation of what, what science would have to do with this. Or another way to think of it is uh, one of the <coughs> early ways in which the philosophical way in which living labor was conceived was as praxis. Uh, somehow putting theory and practice together. Now we seem to think that living labor is actually characterized more by the concept of metabolism. Both of those are in Marx. You can find both praxis and metabolism, but kind of what does it mean if one rethinks labor as metabolism? So that's kind of, that's one of the, that's kind of the next chapter. And indeed, as you might think, from wageless life, having tried to problematize the idea of the wage, it makes sense that the next chapter is, starts basically. So what is this life that we're talking about uh, in this? So that's a few kind of thoughts. I'm interested in your reactions, criticisms. This is still um, in progress. I knew this was going to be a mistake <laughs> to try to... Uh, um, <laughs> 
let, uh, since I don't have the conclusion, let me turn it another kind of way. Uh, oh, yeah, sort of how I got into it. One of the criticisms of Marx's theory of labor is that uh, it sees, uh, and there's a number of people, is that its productionism is too close to 19th century thermodynamics. That Marx basically sees the human body as a kind of machine. And there's some very interesting writing about how Marx was influenced by thermodynamics and whether or not. And so then the question of like, is it, uh, and that there's kind of a contradiction between on the one hand, Marx as a theorist of human nature coming out of his Hegelian youth, and then a later Marx who sort of gives up all of that apparently and seems to adopt this thermodynamic labor model in which work is really about force and energy and those sorts of things. So that's how I got into this in some kind of way. Andreas Huysens, uh, right, it's his book, The Human Machine, very powerful. There's so several people who have put this stuff out there. And then I discovered, actually going through these biologists, that Marx was also, and no one has really talked about this too much, of exactly the same generation as the founding moment of modern life sciences. Now we know Marx was very interested in Darwin and evolution, and that's one side of it, and thought of as and Engels as well. But they were also really interested in the new theory of the cell. That the German inventors of the theory of the cell were in Berlin in university at the same time as Marx. Marx seems to have known one of them. And when that stuff is coming out in the 1860s, the new way of thinking of the cell, the cell's metabolism, the question of kind of what bacteria is, one of the early, it's, and this is how I think, one of the early places in which life as a productive force, a theme very much in contemporary debate, is in the brewing industry and Pasteur's work on how bacteria are involved in fermentation and all of that. And so basically what I'm trying to do is to somehow kind of split the difference between the thermodynamic Marx and the philosophical young Marx by thinking of Marx, and it seems to me that, that is clear. And so indeed, in the very, here we go, lest you think this is totally crazy, in the introduction to capital, Marx says he wants to look at the commodity. Why? Because the commodity is the cell form of capitalist society. And I always just read that as a kind of weird metaphor. You know, okay, that's fine. We all know it's a cell farm. But what I'm basically saying is actually to use that metaphor is brand new for Marx. It's kind of like this is the new way of understanding life and the body through the cell uh, form. And so this, this is not well formulated, but it's kind of, that's kind of the question that I'm raising to myself. And then the next gen, so there's really three moments in that essay. There's the age of the cell, which is how to rethink what Marx meant by living labor in terms of the cell theory of his moment. There's the age of the gene in the or 1930s and 40s when a group of Marxist geneticists are rethinking some of these concepts in that age and then our own age of recombinant DNA or whatever of that and to, so the essay will attempt to <laughs> move from those three different moments in terms of what it means uh, uh, what living labor means and what life as a productive force which is at the heart of thinking about our present economy is that somehow life itself is a productive force. Yeah, that was actually relatively clear. Mm -hmm. for, for, you know, you know what it's like. I just made you all go around. It's like you're in the middle of these projects. What exactly is the project? Um, so I, I had another question, uh, which is, uh, you know, at the end of each this life, okay, um, 
So just more clarification on um, on the notion of um, a virtual pauper, right? So um, um, you say Marx is not arguing that all workers are are or will become beggars, as the initiation thesis always often attributed to him. Rather, in his account of bare life, since exchange required for means of living, the selling of labor power is accidental and indifferent to their organic presence, the worker is a virtual pauper. Okay, but my understanding of Marx is that selling of labor power is absolutely central to this. It's not accidental, but it's central to his understanding of how capitalism works. Yes, except, and that's the difference between why this has the capital way of reading it and the Grundrisse. It's not accidental to the way capital works, yes. but it is accidental to the circulation of all of us as sellers of labor power. Whether or not we can sell that labor power is accidental to our organic, and that phrase there is here, to our, that organic presence I think is in, in Marx's own one. As a kind of paraphrase that line there is accidental and indifferent to their organic presence. That isn't actually Denning's prose, as a kind of uh, paraphrase of, of Marx's uh, term there. And so that's what, and I think what's, that is, oh, he goes after <laughs> what I've already said, the conclusion of this essay, the least form, but you're right to do it. Uh, but I do feel like that actually captures in the end the two sides of the tradition uh, that are there. And that the capital version is looking at it from the point of view of capital. Or as Wallerstein put it very nicely one time, how you would look at it from the point of view of the accumulators. Uh, and, uh, and so from that point of view, yes, it's not accidental at all. Uh, but, but the virtual pauper emerges not in capital, but in the part of the Grundrisse where I think Marx is trying to see it from the other side. One of the other games, one of the other essays that I have already written and delivered a few times as a talk, uh, basically tries to say what would happen if you took it's a different way of thinking. All of those concepts, the circulation of capital we have, you know, the accumulation of capital, and just every time instead of of capital, put of labor in there. Right? It di puts a different sense of even, we talk about the movement of capital. So if what, what happens if one thinks labor movements as the movement of labor? In a, and, it, and it does kind of work, because on the one hand it both points to issues of actual migration and mobility of workers, and yet also the way in which, and that's one of the double senses of accumulation. The accumulation of labor is not only in a variety of ways, the accumulation of capital, right? Getting lots of labor power is indeed the necessity for capital to produce uh, capital and surplus. On the other hand, the accumulation of labor is the multiplication of the proletariat, as Marx said. It's the large assembly of workers into cities. The, what is it? the accumulation of labor is one of the names of the city. And so there's a long reflection on what, what is the place of the city in this tradition and how do we think about cities. Indeed, remember, in Engels' condition of the working class in England in 1844, he starts the thing, he says, I'm going to do a book about the working class, and then he stops and says, oh, imagine you're walking into London and you're on a bridge and you look and, and it becomes all about the city. And later on, it goes through neighborhoods and the livelihoods of people. Later on, he'll go back to the factories and the mines. But there's this weird detour that is the first half of the book. Because in some sense, the two, two classic ways of the accumulation of labor have been the accumulation of labor in those things that we think of as cities, population centers, one way or another, and in those places we think of as workplaces, 
offices, factories. We should accumulate large numbers, universities. We got 10,000 people working at our university. You probably have equivalent. That's an accumulation of labor. And on the other hand, the political organizations of whether they're labor parties or unions or a variety of other things, are a kind of accumulation of labor. So part of this is to try to use that concept as a way to um, move between these different, what, what are generally seen as quite different sorts of uh, elements uh, in, in, an analysis, in an, that same sort of an analysis from the point of view of... Uh, that other base superstructure that I put at the beginning of the wageless life there. What happens if one imagines dispossessed households no longer with the means of subsistence, first having to live and make a living, and then sending out hostages to the wage society, the wage economy, hoping, which is the way most wage labor has actually been. Is some person is sent out to get this job and send some remittances back, and whether it's just for part of the day or whatever, it's another way to think about the book. It's like the nine to five versus the five to nine. We've had a much better account of what happens in the what is it? It's, uh, nine to five is often thought of as the moment of production. But from this point of view, that's the moment of the consumption of labor power. From 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. is the moment of the production of labor power, which is a really underthought through, right? You see what I mean? Even that kind of play. In the end, I would agree with Marx that by the time you play the production consumption game enough times, those terms don't mean that much because they turn into each other. But that initial sense that if one begins from the moment of production, one is really beginning from the moment of the production of labor power in all of those households and neighborhoods of ordinary life, which allows people to then sell that labor power and have it consumed. And so that's really the kind of, and I think in, every, in all of Marx's account, that dialectic is there. He assumes for us to be thinking on both sides. He ended up spending, for a variety of reasons, most of his time on thinking through that the other moment, how capital accumulates. In part because he wanted to argue so much that even though the wage labor contract looked like a free and equal, fair and balanced exchange, it wasn't. And so that's why he put it rhetorically at the center. But it was never at the theoretical center. You don't have to have a job to be a proletarian. You just have to have the imperative to find somehow to make a living because you've been dispossessed of the ways to make a living that people have had over time and those traditional ones. That, I think, is kind of the starting point for this. So that helps. And that's a sort of, and that's yeah, kind of why you're a yeah, virtual yeah. pauper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, virtual, so. Uh, yeah, the last thing I'll show you is <laughs> because it's also very pregnant, like yeah. a set of you know two words, right? Virtual. Yes. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how much that one will last in the end. I there was that was a kind of I, I had a hard time of figuring out where I was going to end this particular essay for this purpose, and that seemed like an interesting one. How far I'll end up taking it. There is at least one other person who's taken independently. Oh, I have his name somewhere. Working a really interesting book, damn, was on uh, Japanese labor and actually plays with the virtual popper thing. And I can look that up in, in whatever. So yeah, his first book was based on dissertation. I'm forgetting his name right now. Really interesting. Uh, and the only other, and really, I think, came at it completely, well, not completely, he was also reading the Grundry so I thought, this is a strange word, and sort of took it, you know, took it and worked with it. And his thinking, and because he's really writing about uh, issues of day labor and tem in the early 20th century and temporary work in Japan. Uh, it's a very interesting book.
you a little bit more about like how I guess you were talking about the accidental with in, in relation to like the organic I, su I assume the, the like the physical body of, of the laborer and, and you're mentioning something about how it's accidental it's yeah I picked up on that and I, and I was uh let me try to dodge that in this kind of way um, one of the, one of the differences, or one one of the things I think that at a certain point you get trained in a certain kind of way of thinking, and then at a certain point you feel like, well, yes, I believe that because I was trained it, but actually that's not really the way in which I fundamentally go at it. And so I was trained at a way in which one had to read Marx as a young Hegelian first. And, and you know, the Frankfurt School and Jameson and a whole variety of 20th century Marxism and to get out of actually all of that kind of Stalinist reductionism, that was great. And so you actually had to be a philosopher before you could be a Marxist, and you had to speak Hegelian to be a Marxist. I no longer believe that. I think it's actually quite interesting that Marx came out of that tradition, but if it had not been for Engels' book on the working class, if it had not been for Engels' discovery as a young man from the provinces, which is what the Rhineland was, going to the center of the new economy, to Manchester, to work in the family firm. And then, it's a remarkable book, at 24 years old, not knowing too much English before he gets there, not having a college education. He had been, unlike Marx, Marx goes through the whole thing, is going to work on a PhD and end up becoming a philosopher. His dissertation is on ancient Greek philosophy, right? Engels is trained a merchant education where you have to know a lot of languages. So he, by the end of his life, I think he knew something like 15 languages because merchants had to know lots of languages. And so Engels ends up in Manchester and writes this extraordinary account of essentially the new world of that moment. And when they get together, for me, Marx sees what's in that book. And that changes him from being a young Hegelian into the weird combination of the philosophical tradition with this other one. And so then I end up finding, see, that's where it is. It, and when I teach a course on socialism and Marxism, I begin with the condition of the working class and that 20 and challenge everyone in that undergraduate class. You write as good a book as this when you're 24. And, uh, and there's a lot of mistakes and there's bits that he took from his secondary sources and whatever, but man, that's as good as there is in the tradition. Uh, even later on, when they republish it, Marx says, <laughs> we might think of this today, boy, everything seems so gray and boring now and so unpossibility. We had, there's so much enthusiasm of youth in that book, you know. We really thought the revolution was right around the corner when you wrote that book. Um, the reason I say that is because I do think when Marx uses that word on accidental, He's actually playing with a philosophical tradition about necessity and accident, which goes back to his own interest in the ancient Greek philosophers who were in question about that early materialism, which I don't really feel like I could actually answer. So, so when I did it, it was the vernacular accidental, which I think is there, in the, which is my explanation, that it is only an accident that you will find the work. And so it's not that you are actually immiserated in some kind of way, that's on Popper, but because you don't have in your own being the ability to sustain your life. So you are a Popper in that way. And so, and then it's only in that accidental. But I'm sure that there's actually a, a, a philosopher would who really knew that philosophical history would probably play because remember later on they'll make an argument that whatever socialism is is the transmission from the the world of necessity to a world of freedom and so that that game of thinking through necessity and accident uh, is I think crucial to the philosophical formation I don't know if that's a, that's a, a way of not answering you but hopefully saying something <laughs>
interesting. I was just I, the the interest. The thing that was really interesting was about this idea of like the organic or the cell or the body, and in relation to labor. And I was wondering, like, in the context I'm thinking of, being from California, or like even working on Steinbeck, and like the the surplus of labor that you get with with pickers during the picker season, and then uh, some, you know, sometimes the employers won't need as many, but also too. It's not, they're, they're, I guess they're being organic bodies and being paupers and, and being kind of perennially made as paupers has to do with their very metabolisms and where they need the work to live, they need the work to eat. Um, and so that's why they're forced to take lower and lower wages and then they, they're thrown into this vicious cycle of being virtual paupers all the time. But it has very much to do with... I guess their metabolism, their organic cells, and just sustaining their own lives. Yeah. I don't know, like, yeah, how to cross that. Over yeah, and I guess that's where I would probably, in the long run, move away from the virtual pauper and be arguing. That's why I'm so intrigued at that notion of living labor, yeah. which, at one hand, is kind of an entirely a place. If indeed throughout the tradition, there's been a long kind of form and content thing that basically one has to realize that there is a social form to these material contents and that the social form under capitalism is labor power which is not exactly something that you can pin down but the material content uh, the useful thing is actually living labor the reason why someone purchases labor power is in order for you to then use your living labor and actually get stuff done of one kind or another. And yet that always seems like the like you in the exchange value, use value thing, much more attention is put on the exchange value and money and cash and all of that thing than the use value of the commodities that are there. And in some sense, so if living labor is actually that li use value, one of the things that it can't be saved up in the same kind of way. Uh, it has to have, you know, because we are organic beings, if we don't feed ourselves and all of that, we'll die in a way that uh, is true of other kinds of things. Buildings do decay and all of that. And part of Marx's argument throughout, right, is just look at this place around it. Looks like it's buildings, it looks like it's other. Without the 10,000 people who come every day and work, the whole place falls down. That without the in constant infusion of living labor, the dead labor will never is not revivified. And actually, that kind of dialectic is crucial to to understanding this. And yet, our tendency is to so often see and be either awed by or oppressed by. Oh, how lucky I am! to be here at Cornell giving my little talk and my little seminar or whatever because this is Cornell after all. But in fact, without all of us turning up this morning, there is no Cornell uh, and all of that. And that's really, the, that's kind of in some ways to me the most radical element of this tradition in some in ways. And then to think about that. And, the, and then precisely the difficulty of people in the situation of having to maintain uh, our this year, I'm going to continue on this work. Another way to put it is, oh, I'm not deep enough into this. This is actually because everybody is indeed rereading Hannah Arendt in these days, and so, and she is one of the people who thinks a lot about work and labor, but in part because she feels like that is so tied to our organic presence to reproduction, to all this, that that's actually not quite as truly human as language, poesis and praxis and the polis, right? That those kind of, that really the human condition is not that part of us that is the living bit, because that's actually what we share with animals. <laughs> that actually the human condition is our discourse and our polis, which comes out of a great tradition of political thought, but it does seem to me that the thought of work and daily life, daily life a key concept in this, is indeed that other side, the side of life, the side of what's called reproduction, the side of maintenance. <laughs>
uh, our working group on globalization and culture this year, our topic is maintenance. And everyone is working bits and pieces of thinking through the maintenance of people, the maintenance of things, the maintenance of social order. Because maintenance is a weird and intriguing word that goes in different ways. So I'm hoping to do some more of this work. Uh, in thinking of this uh, as kind of a, the, a, a maintenance is a term that Arendt uses a number of times um, in, in order to understand. Because I guess for me, and it's there in that title, I don't know whether exactly, maybe that's why I'm thinking about Wageless Life as the title of this whole book, because in, in the course, clearly work and daily life end up be a kind of a dialectical union between them. It, it does seem to be one of the problems of some forms of the older labor history was it was kind of work without daily life. Uh, it was what happens in the consumption of labor power without enough attention to how labor power is produced. Though even to put it that way is kind of a crazy, you know, one of the original things was that's why labor power is itself a fictional commodity because labor power isn't produced in the same kinds of ways as other <coughs> commodities are. Land, too, not produced in that same kind of way as our, uh, you know, iPads and MacBooks and all of that. I want to um, talk ask a question about representation and how you think about that. Um, and I guess, in part, because like all of us, it's a selfish question about something I'm thinking about a lot in my work. Um, one of my projects is thinking about how women represent themselves as farmers or are represented as farmers and or workers in Myanmar right now. So, you know, in representations of global labor, representation is obviously really central and, and you use that angle, but I was also thinking about wageless life and what you, you phrase as a sort of genealogical examination of the informal economy and unemployment and how representation is in play there. And specifically, I guess, this entanglement of when representations have material consequences or political consequences and how, which in some ways is the resting point, sorry to do the conclusion move, but is the resting point of your other essay, which we haven't dug into yet. So I'm sort of wondering, yeah, how you think about what these representations by Salgado and the World Bank, or what types of representations are needed now and what politics might, might spread arise from those. Yeah. Uh, I guess what, you know, uh, I came out of a moment where the critique of representation was kind of a crucial element. People wanted to get away from representation. I was always drawn to this concept, partly because of, uh, and I'm not sure it works in all languages, I'd be intrigued, but certainly in English it is this kind of weird way of linking, um, uh, speaking for and depicting. Right, that to represent is both the kind of political representation of someone who speaks for you in one way or another, and representative parliamentary democracy is built on that, and yet on the other hand it is about depicting. And it's always been intriguing that one of the ways in which we see it with the election yesterday, which ways in which people claim to be able to speak for you is by depicting you. That that the, so in some sense, and that's where my second one is. I it's not it, I don't can't really figure out which is the most politically effective or whatever because it seems to me that all politics is in some sense the claim to represent a group by depicting that group, and that that I take that to be in some ways one of if one takes the great Marxist political theorist of the 20th century, Gramsci, that all of Gramsci's, and he says indeed, a political crisis is when the relations of representation fall apart. Parties no longer seem to represent the classes and class fractions that they used to represent. Uh, and if it's a real crisis, all of a sudden figures Caesarism will be his name for it. He's analyzing Mussolini. Figures who seem strangely to stand above or outside the older form of representation can emerge 
claiming to represent a new community, a new whole, and depict that community in various ways. And not just, and depict it, depict it is perhaps too visual a metaphor there, but maybe sing for it in some ways. And behind noise uprising, that's part of my argument there. Why that question of the politics of this music, even though the musicians did not necessarily have the politics. Some of them were not much more interested in just getting another gig or whatever. That nonetheless, by putting different voices out, circulating those voices on shellac, there was a kind of different form of enfranchisement. So that game, and it seems, and another thing is, it does seem to me that uh, the tradition of critical theory that we have has thought, with only a few exceptions, not that imaginatively about forms of political representation in so-called, what I like to think of as parliamentary universal suffrage states, otherwise known as democracies, but that's such a complicated word or whatever. But, you know, it's different. Marx's generation didn't know really any parliamentary universal suffrage states. And the tradition uh, that, was, you know, Lenin was imagining state and revolution in a situation of essentially a decaying uh, a, a empire with a czar at the top of it. So it was, it's really hard to kind of get through. And it's moved in one of the divides between those tra parts of the tradition that have tried to imagine the kind of party politics, but then have fallen into relatively straightforward uh, liberal thought many times on kind of how parties work. So I do think that's a roundabout way. I think actually the, the qu set of questions about what Stuart Hall would call, he used to, the, it's a wonderful essay where he talks about the, re the, the nexus between the relations of force, a concept he takes from Gramsci, and the relations of representation a concept that I think he actually develops in that way. And so I'm very interested in those relations of representation that then takes apart not having to worry about the question of whether or not something is an actual, fully authentic representation of oneself or one group. No representations are. I'm doing a representation of myself today. It is some ways, but it's also structured by the reverberations, how you represented yourself, how other kinds of things, so that any representation takes place. And in the relations of representations that are structured by Cornell and a seminar here. If all of a sudden I started talking about myself in a whole other way, you would like, what? This isn't what I came here to for. That's a totally different organic, you know, I could go on my organic and medical issues, you know. And sometimes that actually, there are conversations, particularly if you pass the 60 year, where all of a sudden that seems to be the way in which people represent themselves. And it's like the weather or something. So that actually we all engage in a whole set of relations of representation in that way. And for me, that becomes both the first thing, uh, which is one of my colleagues, I remember her asking a question, Alicia Schmidt Camacho, very smart woman, wrote a great book called Migrant Imaginaries. Some years ago, when we first put together this initiative on labor and culture, we had the then retiring David Montgomery Give, and he was a great labor historian. He gave a great talk, and Alicia asked a question. I forget exactly how it was asked, but it was basically, well, how did what you're calling workers become workers in the first place? As a concept, how can you imagine? And it basically, because David was a great labor historian, but he took for granted the fact that there were workers. And somehow she put, that put one of the things in my mind, it was like, yes, that was the way one had to write the history of workers in the 20th century without assuming that there were workers in the 20th century. That in part, that was a process of representation. In some case, where groups of workers got together, sang Solidarity Feather, and claimed we are workers. The other one, equally interesting, I hope you notice it, and through things where the state invents 
labor apparatuses that starts counting people and calling them workers. It's one reason I think we can't, even if the labor movement isn't as strong or as powerful, we can't get away from this stuff because the state is still counting us out there. I just you know, take a look. One of my favorite websites is the Bureau of Labor Statistics website and how they try to imagine what we're doing. We see it in the insane kinds of stuff the, uh, that is in all of the newspaper thing. The sense that blue collar equals not college education. Well, you can ask people when they come out of a poll, do you have a college education or not? Though that means lots of weird different things. Because there's all kinds of people who have partial college. Does that mean, did you get a bachelor's degree? Does it mean, did you ever take a course at a community college? The kind of lines of what having a college education or not. And then how that's actually related to the kinds of work that people have and whether it's white collar or blue collar or pink collar because they didn't go and say, are you blue collar? That's a kind of, let alone the, then the, how that rates an in income. One of the exit polls showed to me that basically right now, I double check according to the times, median household income is 55000 a year. That means half of all households in America make less than 55000 and half make more than 55000 If you look at the exit polls, people, uh, uh, the groups making less than 50000 voted for Clinton. All the groups making more than 50000 voted for Trump. That's not the story you would get from any of the newspapers about all those blue collar... I don't know. It's kind of weird. Partly it's because their thing, the crucial one, is like they go from 50,000 to 100,000. Well, that's a big jump. And it's not clear. It's like, are, is it all those people at the 95? You know, and how people, even what they say their household income is very kind of complicated in that. But these are all, and so that's where the kinds of representations, whether they become powerful artists. So, to take those two examples, on the one hand, the World Bank, imagine what I loved about that, and I hope you found that amusing too. Immense amounts of data and statistics brought together by wonderful, I'm sure they hire top-notch people out of places like here and out of my place as well to do all of this work. But when they want to sum it up, they turn it into a story of four people, imaginary people, uh, that are the whole of the world economy. And that actually, if you take those four and spread them out, they equal, I think, I forget the number, 80% of the world or something. I had it back in, in the essay there. You know, the Vietnamese farmer, the symbolic daughter who's working in essentially a Vietnamese maquiladora, then the symbolic sister who has gone to France and is working as a waitress, and then, of course, the symbolic Jean-Paul who's lost his job because of the migration. The whole migration story story is the introduction to that World Bank thing. That's how the World Bank imagined, represented that thing. It's very powerful. We ourselves have a hard time thinking outside of it. One of the key parts throughout all of this is that I think we end up growing up with a set of giant class characters that it's hard to break from. And that particularly since capitalism changes the working class faster than our imaginations of it. We're always stuck generation behind in what our imagination of what the work people are actually doing is. Or we're leaping forward, the other kind of like, imagine nobody's doing any work, right? You know, that somehow we really are in a virtual economy where we're all just living on air. Uh, and so those two moments, and the, you know, which is there, you know, who was it? Gates, who had his, you know, built his mansion up there on the thing where there wasn't going to be any servants or any work, you know, it would be an entirely electronic household or whatever, you know, that that utopia of a workerless technology has always been, it has generated every one of the kind of Silicon Valley sorts of senses that, you know.
And one of the intriguing things is why I'm interested in that issue of maintenance, because the maintenance workers, the cleaners, that that of keeping stuff from decaying, all of those machines, you know. Uh, we used to have, we were playing with this in the group meeting the other day, where we were looking at the Maytag, how many people remember the Maytag Repairman television commercials? Go on YouTube and look at them. It's one of the great moments of post-war consumer durability. Because the Maytag repairman, who was one of the great figures of, of, of post-war advertising in America, was the guy who had the loneliest man in America. Because Maytag washing machines didn't break down. So you didn't need a repairman. And the opening one, he's training all the young repairmen, and he basically says, now you have to realize this is going to be a really hard job because no one needs you. And then think of that in terms of what that is, and then something that I'll bet most of you have done. Going to the genius bar at the Apple store. You know, just reconceiving the Apple repair shop <laughs> as the genius bar for the kind of necessary maintenance of this sort of thing is, I think, so that that question of kind of what, and one of the big parts of this whole, of this book is rethinking this kind of word which is, and that's where the double thing is. You can't reject the representations because the metaphors are so important to all of us understanding what it is to do. So let's just take one of the most dominant ones, the service sector. Service work is an entirely incoherent concept. It was invented back in the 1920s because they understood there was agriculture, there was manufacturing, all the rest was service. It was kind of the leftover category. And yet we have one of the largest union in the country which claims that it is Service Employees International Union. And all of the kind of ideologies around service. And one of the great ones, I always use this one in work in daily life. Hopefully you've all seen Made in Manhattan. Uh, one of my romantic comedies or my favorite <laughs> genre in all of this. And there's the moment when uh, the Bob Hoskins character, right, it's in a, ho a fancy Manhattan hotel. Julia Roberts is working in it. She gets fired or whatever. Anyway, the moment, the clip that I show a million times is when Bob Hoskins, who's kind of the butler type, right, in the foreman, he says... We may do service, but we are not servants. And there's this whole thing, you know, that sense of could right, because here we have a kind of whole category of work that we all, you know, in fact, that's what we are as teachers. We are part of the service sector in that. Uh, and yet is tied to that older, very disreputable sense of being a servant with all of the lack of recognition, the lack of dignity, the lack of independence that being a servant meant, and yet, and, and what it means for that. So a lot of this book is indeed, and then how all kinds of things, so that in fact if you work in a, if you're an immigrant woman worker in a nail salon, you're in the same economic category if you're working for a Wall Street hedge fund and making hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably more than that. Those are both part of the service sector. And you can go and look at the Federal Reserve puts out reports <laughs> on the service sector, which are as incoherent as that. And so the question, so part of this is like really one whole section of this book is kind of rethinking the representation of the service sector and how that uh, I don't have, in most of these cases, I don't really have, but that's not theory, I guess. It's, theory is not about coming up with the answers. It's problematizing the very words that we uh, work with. So that's what I'm hoping to do. I don't have a better, even in this one, I admit right at the beginning, that wageless is the same kind of a word as unemployed or informal, this kind of negative word. And maybe it would be possible to turn it right upside down so that it didn't feel like a lack. Um, I, think I have, I guess I have two questions. One, going back to the previous 
where you talked about the living labor responses and then metabolism, but then everything that we were talking about was social reproduction. And I was wondering if there's something that kind of doesn't um, communicate that with terms like taxes and even um, metabolism because they're so overloaded that social reproduction or maintenance, et cetera, does. Right. And then the second part was um, the agrarian in all of this and how that kind of, the, the agrarian and, you know, the, the, this kind of, I guess when you were talking about the service sector workers right now, it made me think of um, how in the, you know, the classical agrarian question, the division between production and social reproduction is, uh, or the, f it's not just the nine to five and the five to nine, but also yes. the division between the two and the hierarchy between the two, and how the service sector work is kind of, um, bringing it to the forefront, but in some way that that debate or that tension was also present in the exceptionalism of the peasant or the veteran. Yeah. Um, let me take the harder one first, because I think, I'm not, uh, I haven't figured out how, uh, I'm thinking through, or whether I can think through, the specificity of agrarian work in this. I must admit that uh, I came at this from a, a kind of tradition that has not paid as much attention to this. Uh, I remember when I first uh, set up the initiative on labor and culture. My model at Yale, there were very few good models at Yale, was Jim Scott's Agrarian Studies. And Jim joked, he said, well, I'll take care of the countryside and you can do the city. <laughs> and I, actually, I think Jim did a better job of moving from Agrarian Studies to the rest of the world, including its cities, than I have going the other direction. Uh, so that one I still am trying to think about. Another way to do it is that um, with this course, I ended up trying to, I, uh, I invented a new way of dealing with uh, what are graduate teachers. Uh, the traditional version at Yale is that you do a lecture course when there's a bunch of books and they run discussion sections and they all run the same discussion section with whatever books that you assign. This is all, you probably have some version of this. It's a deadly form of education because no one in the room wanted to read this particular book. The only person who chose the book is not in the room. And so, this, this, believe it or not, there's a roundabout way. And one of the difficulties was doing work in daily life and global capitalism. Not only could, how could I teach this, but how could anyone TA for this? And so I ended up what was very interesting, I thought, uh, working on a double frame. I did do a series of lectures because there were a bunch of students. It was a lecture course and all of that. And then I recruited graduate teachers who worked on specific topics and turned their discussion section into a kind of little research seminar on, and the cases that have won, numerous ones over the years have been ones on issues of migration. Numerous ones have been on issues of care work. I had one person, Monica Martinez, who's now teaching at Brown, and is fascinating, put together an amazing section on agricultural and agrarian work. And really, that was a great kind of, and then I would visit the different ones, and it felt like there were with people, and she was really interested. And that was one of that moment where it felt like there was a kind of dialogue or tension between the grand narrative that I was trying to tell in the undergraduate lectures and her real concentration with the 12 or 15 students in her section, probably 18 or whatever, who were working on agrarian things. Uh, and I still, if not, I tried to think about it a lot uh, in particular in conversations with her about that. Uh, but that one I'm still not sure. I still feel like I'm, 
Um, not exactly how the differences in the material content, uh, whether making something differently, and the, la and the material content of the labor processes will fits into this. The other one is much easier to say because that there is now a written chapter which I've given it because uh, there's another form of wageless life which is not the subject of this chapter, but is the subject of another one, which is unwaged labor in the household. And there, there is an attempt to kind of uh, go back to the domestic labor debates of the feminisms of the 1970s and 80s, rethink those. Uh, I haven't reread that essay real recently, so I'm not sure I could actually... Uh, articulate my arguments there, but I think in part it is uh, one of those arguments is that the invention of the notion of daily life really comes, here's kind of one of the argument, comes out of two aspects of the of new left thought, if one would call it that way. On the one hand, and the term that we get is sort of the Lefebvre version, which is living in a consumer society in some sense. All of that stuff that is somehow neither work nor the household, kind of shopping and all of that, and that becomes in the sort of Lefebvre tradition is daily life. The other version of what daily life is, is actually the unwaged labor of reproduction in the household that is the distinctive um, uh, emergence out of the domestic labor debates. Uh, particularly, I think for me, the key figure is Maria Mises' great book on patriarchy and accumulation, which I always teach in the course on Marxism. Uh, and, uh, and that, because in some ways that attempted to synthesize with its own difficulties the uh, notion of... Uh, uh, sorry, to synthesize those debates and then put it together with, again, these terms which come to us as nouns but should be verbs. And in her case, saying that housewifification is as important a project as proletarianization. Mm -hmm. That those are two, that the accumulation of capital is a process of the proletarianization of some people's and the house wifification of other peoples. And, that, and it's another thing in the sense of why the wage relation, which is part of the proletarianization one, is not a necessary one for the process of the accumulation of labor. So that, I'm not sure, I'm, I was, I'm less persuaded by the, the, her more general theory of patriarchy, that first half of the guy, and she, and she, and I feel like there's some tension in those two elements. Uh, uh, the other thing that I find very interesting, and I try to track this in some sense, in, and in thinking about the larger frames of it, is that the striking shift from the attempt to theorize household labor, domestic labor, the housewife's work, all of those kinds of terms in the 60s and 70s, to the point where because of the commodification of the labor in the household, one has a new emergence of variously waged workers working as maids and daycare uh, centers, and there's a kind of movement of wage labor. And so if you actually look at, if you take, this is what it attempts, look at the entire intellectual tradition, you find that one of the reasons that the debate over domestic labor disappeared, there were two reasons, so I'll come back to remind you about value. One of them will be this shift of the same scholars and theorists who are interested in it in to try to understand the new international migration of care workers and the kind of outsourcing, in some ways, of household labor to a new class of, again, largely women, largely women of color, working as maids and nannies. And so, and that that new literature, 
which emerges throughout the 90s and the last 20 years, is kind of stands in a sort of structural same place as the imagine the attempt to theorize uh, the labor of housewives, and I think that's actually one of the shifts in the transformation of household labor. It's not that there isn't still unwaged work going on in households, in the maintenance of households, but that the remarkable bringing of um, temporary, precarious, somewhat waged, partially waged workers into the household and to move, and in fast food, and also to move a whole set of household functions, eating meals, having children taken care of, elder care, into a new privatized economy, that changes that a bit. So, there's, so I do think there's a kind of link between the emergence of a kind of care economy outside the household with that earlier debate. The other reason, and here, um, Oh, I'm blanking on names this morning. There's one person. I will look it up as well. One of the problems with the original domestic labor debate was, and this is a key thing that I'm trying to argue throughout this, they ended up wanting to fit it into a theory of capital and a theory of value. And so the question that ended up breaking the debate apart was, does household labor create value for capital? And if so, how can you do the mathematics to show that it does or doesn't? And so, and there I felt like, and there were interesting arguments on one side or another, but there I do feel it's one of my things of wanting to reverse, that the other side of the theory of value and the theory of the accumulation of capital, as important as it is, is that the theory of the accumulation of labor does not depend on a theory of value. That it actually the production of labor power is not a value process. It is a process of livelihood, of daily life. It's a much more complex process in many ways. And uh, uh, there was, there's one figure who, who was part of that original debate who makes that point. I cite it, I will, uh, again, I'm... I didn't. Re I reread these pieces more than the other parts of the book, and it has been a while because the music book has sort of taken over my mind. Uh, so partly one reason I wanted to do this seminar was because this summer, having finally gotten the music book out, I sat down and I reread all the parts and began to think, "Wow, maybe there is a book in the in the labor one." But that would be so. I am. I'm hoping that by the time I'm done, there will be some actual contribution or theoretical thinking of how unwaged work in the household fits into this theory of the accumulation of labor. Was it Kathy Weeks that you were working Kathy, in many ways, was working, uh, uh, in fact, we, there was a tremendous conference down at Gainesville. Gainesville has a Marxist reading group that has run conferences for nearly 15 or 20 years. And Kathy and I were both the keynote speakers uh, together and had some really useful, I've been long dialogue with her, but it's real, no, it's really one of the people of the original generation writing in the late 70s that Kathy Weeks talks about. Uh, Lisa Vogel was the one. She's the, she's the only one of that, of that earlier generation in the 70s who really, uh, other people wrote great stuff, don't get me wrong, but who actually sort of made that argument that actually trying to figure this out in terms of value was not the way to go about it, that that actually was really trying to think through this in a mode like the Chakrabarti stuff that I use there. It's like once you're speaking that language, you're already speaking the language of political economy, and so you're actually not going to understand it. Uh, and, and because it's uh, that the language of political economy, the language of commodities can certainly tell you certain things, 
but particularly those parts of daily life that are outside, that are, I'm not exactly outside, but in the shadow of the commodity form, are going to be less explainable through value theory and the mathematics of value. And that's why, and of course, of course, one of the crucial things which Kathy has brought our attention back to was, nonetheless, and that's where that question of the fact that there's always this dialectic between, and I tried to get it with the unemployed, we are forced into representing ourselves in the terms that they give us. So it's not very long after the state starts counting people as unemployed that unemployed workers say, we are the unemployed, this is the unemployed movement, and that that dialectic goes back and forth. It's not very long after that sense that, no, this housework is unvaluable, it's not part of the gross national product, we won't count all of this, that one of the movement will say, wages for housework which has a totally contradictory element, as people have pointed out, of kind of wanting to then put the cash nexus in the midst of it, but the actual thing was to insist that it be, to be insist that it be valued, and yet end up valuing it in the categories of the economy that you're trying to overthrow. Yeah. But it's tremendously powerful. Once one had, uh, there, I can remember, I have... I don't know if we still have this or whatever. Uh, they had made uh, wages for housework potholders. Those were great. So that they would actually sit in your kitchen with wages for housework on the potholder, you know, attached to the refrigerator or whatever. Because uh, there was a couple places in the U.S. It didn't take off that much in the U.S. It was more a European one. But there was definitely a group in Baltimore, I remember, and a few people moved to New Haven, I think from the Baltimore one. And there was a chapter of wages for housework in New Haven briefly, uh, 70 seven, eight, something like that, I think. Uh, and that's one of those moments where we end up inventing, the, having to use the, rep, the representations that are made by institutions, whether it's states or whatever, in order to represent ourselves. And that's why artists are so important, because artists give us another variety of representations that we can then use and draw on. Uh, so that's to go back to a question. I didn't feel like I fully answered that one. I think also, I mean, along the trajectory of this focus on the international or the globalization of care work, I mean, before that even, I think black feminist writers in the U.S. were at least making the argument that um, black women would, were doing this sort of work outside the home pay, for pay, paid or unpaid through slavery, right? Um, and then also coming back to their homes and creating a sort of uh, a realm of, you could put it in, the, in terms of social reproduction, but not even for capital in the formal sense, right? Creating a space for their children um, that, in, in knowing that they weren't going to go into these traditional um, labor markets. They, right. weren't, they were going to be a, a, a reproduced for this a, a realm of, a, a form of underclass sort of citizenship. Um, or even like de even denied that, the right to work, right? Which you talk about in this um, the wageless life. Um, but yeah, and even like Evelyn the kind of work, yes, yes. She yeah. also does this. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking too about how I think there there are like nuggets of of this like uh, of social reproduction not for capital in these people's work that are really always brought into like um, conversations with Marxist yeah. thinkers. Yeah. No. There's a really good what's the oh uh, what's the name? There's a new a relatively new journal comes out of some place or another. They did a really excellent issue on reproduction in the last year. Uh, oh what is it called viewpoint? Does someone know that? It's like in the cluster of journals like Jacobin and N plus one. They but they tend they're a little bit more social theory than the others or whatever. I think it's called Viewpoint. They did a remarkable both and both putting on the web and republishing some classic um, statements from the past and then a series of arguments there. I guess I I still am trying to figure out ways 
as you might have gotten from with my sense of the usefulness and limits of the production consumption set of terms that I find that reproduction carries many of the same difficulties that the production consumption one and so I'd like to eventually end up with um, some concepts that might be more uh, you know no no it does have it's really quite powerful if you've got a, a term because that really is what great concepts do is that they are able to stand in totally distinct spheres of discourse and seem to link them together like representation does there and reproduction combining on the one hand biological reproduction, the production of kids, social reproduction in a variety of ways, mechanical reproduction in our own sense that there's a kind of that, that once images and sounds were able to be reproduced. So there is a way in which it may not be easy or necessary to get away from a word that is that useful at, at uh, making the uh, translations or transcodings between those different things. I think that may be one reason why we're drawn back to reproduction as, as that with the word. Um, and maybe the why production, you know, I, I, you were talking about literary production. There, it, there are moments where these words are really crucial because you can use the same word in, in standing in different entire discursive places. And, and what so often most of the concepts that we have mean something only in one discursive realm. And so become very difficult to actually put different discourses together. I was wondering if you were going to touch on like H.L. Austin or something, like the Speech Act as far as wageless goes, and, and like, uh, like, like, you were, you, like you were saying, um, there are these categories, like I think in the case of, of uh, what were you mentioning about, like people embracing that, that definition and then unemployed, and then like taking on that, does that, does, do those categories, I guess, do, does that naming of wages, unemployed, is that, where does like the speech act, I guess, fit into that, do or is? No idea. Okay. Never read any of Austin, never <laughs> really okay. thought about speech yeah, act theory and too, all of this, so that one, uh, You, maybe you could tell me whether it would, whether I should be reading it. Uh, well, I think it's, but it's it's interesting what you're talking about, like the Speech Act. Like there are certain speech functions, like saying "I do" when you're married, where then now officially you're married, and like yeah. there's an act where you it, it manifests itself in the world in some way. And I think like this idea, this category of wageless or unemployed or informal, then does kind of create a way that you see an entire group of people. Or a sub a subgroup of people, and then then it kind of feeds back into this, where then they in some cases take on that title, and it becomes understood as that. And it seems like in your article, that's kind of what you're warning against: is that labor and laboring is always changing, and the categories and, and um, aren't don't always fit. We inherit the outdated categories of our grandfathers and fathers or whoever. Um, and by the time we arrive, or we think about things, they need, they need new terms. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's like an, maybe just an interesting direction to go. But then also too, like within the world bank, like who's giving these terms? And um, yeah, I, 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 I think, and I, I think that kind of plays in your idea of re representation a little bit. Um, I, I interned once at the Solidarity Center, which is like a sub group of the AFL-CIO in Washington, and they were starting to do some work, and I think Myanmar, about, uh, and, and somebody else mentioned about the shrimp, shrimp industry, and like, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question, like, how do you represent yourself? 
and then also too within thinking about just how you raise money for for aid and too like how do you represent people in the global south now uh, a lot of, sadly i think a lot of what makes money is making people look like vulnerable or they need help but that's that's a dangerous category um and i think especially with 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 those issues of representation i guess i guess i'm working around this how do laborers represent themselves or like how do they categorize themselves what's the language they use that's going to be sufficient in trying to understand themselves as people away from like the world bank or whatever how they how they categorize them um it's not really a question I don't yeah, though, let me say one thing on that. It's, I guess maybe the and, and the resistance that I've had, because it's not that I've been unaware that people have used the speech act stuff, is that that seems to move us, and maybe I'm wrong, because I really have not sat down and worked with it, but it did seem to move us back to a kind of methodological individualism. It begins with the sense that individuals, like that famous one of the kind of, is it a performative speech by saying, I, that in some ways that one begins from individuals in some kind of a society. And that's why, I guess for me, the notion that we're already immersed in relations of representation and that the, so, that, that, that the starting point is actually not to be looking at individual speech acts, but at those relations of representation, which may or may not be, and they may have a whole variety of things that are not necessarily speech acts, images, visual images, sounds, a whole set of things that are uh, uh, traditional uh, political alliances. The fact that, you know, you're a, a Democrat or a Republican because your family has been a Democrat or a Republican, whole ver which is essentially a kind of a relation of representation. And then the, you know, uh, uh, one of the... Um, if I can remember how these two were different ones. Well, I'll only do one of them then. I was always taken by, in Bourdieu's work, the tremendous dialectic between habitus and fields. The sense that on the one hand, people are born into and grow up in a certain habitus. And they learn, in a sense, a habitation, a set of habits, a set of clothing, because that carry all of the different connotations that that habit word and it has oh, together. And that are sort of, that are there almost involuntarily, or that you make of yourself there. And yet, on the other hand, this sense that the social world is a set of different kinds of fields that one enters into. And the, I always love that the pairing he has that the hobby just gives you a set of dispositions. Whereas in fields, you take up a position in the field. And for me, the dialectic, I mean, if you had only one of those signs, it would be a kind of non-contradictory whatever. But all of us grow up in one kind of habitus and end up in a different kind of field. We happen to be, at least temporarily, in the academic field, which probably does not work similarly, unless, and there are some people, I wonder about my poor son, anyway, you know, if your hobby just is the same as your field, and that's actually part of his sense of what, real, what inherited cultural capital is, where it feels like you can just walk into this field and take up a position because you have been raised, you know, to that manner, to those habits in some sense. And in some ways we all are, if we, because if, if you really don't have any of the habits, of a particular field, you're probably going to not do very well in that field. But I think lots of us feel like we actually grew up in one kind of habitus and ended up in a field that demands some slightly unfamiliar ways of being in that. And also, because those fields actually probably are changing faster, all of a sudden there's a whole new... Oh, let's, well, you know, even, let's say, in the academic world, there's a whole digital humanities field out there whose 
whose kinds of forms of prestige and forms of recognition and forms of work and labor process are completely different than the ones that uh, were the field that I entered and got a certain kind of position in. And so, for me, that's another kind of, I always found that was a very powerful way. I'm not sure I ever liked his idea of reading all of this as capital, that our ability to, it seems to me in some ways one might turn that again, that there's a kind of, instead of cultural capital and social capital, we could talk about that as cultural labor and social labor since they're in the, or the accumulation, because after all, what is a cultural capital than a certain kind of accumulation? of a social labor, you know, any of you who face at any point an oral field, that's what it is, is that, right, that it is the accumulation of a certain scholarly discourse, every oral field I've ever known is this weird half and half, you have to do half the books that your advisor did, and then half the books are ones you want to do, and of course remember that your advisor had that same half and half, and so, which was to try to get rid of half of their advisor's books and make a space for their own. And so that there is this kind of slow moving, um, accu that kind of accumulation. Those sense, and the sense of that, and even the kind of devaluation of that. If one has established a position in a field dependent on certain things, Maybe some of you are even totally bored. Man, does he have to keep going on about Marx? But just remember, even if you're bored or want to put out, you know, a lot of time, labor was put into the mastering quote of that cultural capital in order to teach that in some kinds of ways. And it's in your interest, perhaps, to want to somehow devalue some of that, then you don't have to repeat that work and actually value new kinds of cultural knowledge that you have. But remember that this logic of valuation and devaluation you will not be immune to. There will be 20 years or 30 years from now where the stuff you so painfully learned, the debates that were absolutely central in 2015, will seem like just so much old, dead labor, a need to be revived, uh, or it has to be revived in a different kind of way. And so that's the kind of, that logic of dead labor and living labor is there which I think is actually a more interesting way to see it as kind of just a, a, a static store of cultural capital. But that that dead labor that all of us have in us in some kind of way, and to accumulate that in order to get, as, as those fields change, as those positions change. I think your oral board thing, it reminded me of um, what you were talking about with, with Marx in the cell, but that's how this genetic passing on, I guess, so like you can, it's like that we, if we want to relate capital to genetic or genetics, it's the traits re, recombining every time, and then there's dominant ones that maybe that show up later, but I mean, whatever. Um, I have another question about like yeah. an American labor in, in like categories, but if, that's kind of off the topic, I think, a little bit, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty selfish question, but um, comparing, I've been thinking about your wages life stuff in relation to my work, and um, there's some really compelling work on the digital housewife and the, the ways in which um, uh, content production on commercial sites is a new form of wageless labor, um, and how it's tied to gender and affective labor in really important ways. So I was just kind of wondering if you would speak on that a bit and think of, like, how does your figure of, the, of, wage, of wageless life kind of fit in with the digital housewife character? Um, and then uh, a second, just a comment. Um, I'm, I've been super interested in the inmates recently, lately, too. Um, and there's a really wonderful conference called the Maintainers of the Stevens Institute of Technology oh, oh. Um, that I went to last year in 2016. And it's also, it's repeating itself in 2017. Uh, it's mostly about um, maintenance of technologies um, and the QA, or quality, quality assurance. But there's, it's, it's kind of increased in breadth and like thinking about maintenance as an important um, Contradiction to innovation and the way that we're kind of praising innovation in general. So, yeah. so, just tell me a bit more about what a digital housewife 
Yeah, it, well, it is or so people who are producing content on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, okay. um, but those are commercial sites. So in a way, that production of content is a form of labor that's unpaid. Right. But it's it's different than other forms of um, unpaid labor in that you're also consuming at the same time. Um, but uh, the biggest demographic of people who are producing that kind of content is 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 often women and often right. middle income women who are. Sometimes also housewives or you know, domestic right. laborers. So, um, so, but but also I think that there's a lot of um, pouring of identity into a lot of this right. content, which kind of which also has some r relation to the um, to the way that uh, domestic labor has been conceptualized over in the 60s. Yeah. So. Um so let me separate that into two different ways, because and I think of both of these are in the, the sort of rethinking of what this service sector is. And I'll take the, what seems to be in some ways the easier one, uh, which is the fascinating work and which is central throughout a bunch of this stuff on affective labor or emotional labor. And the way, and both the, the, um, the genuine interest of that work I think there's kind of a double sense. On the one hand, the sense that the production of certain kinds of affects, whether it's smiling or anything, or, you know, uh, I always at this moment say, right, like being a teacher that seems to be actually interested in all this subject, you know. Yeah. I'm not interested in any of this stuff. I'm just producing this affect so that all you guys will learn this stuff, right? You know, that indeed as a teacher, we, you know, it's not exactly the sort of classic uh, airline uh, uh, um, uh, attendant with a smile in the Arley Hawkshire, or indeed, right, which we all really like if you're in the hospital, the nurse who seems really to be concerned with your health, uh, even though you know that there's a whole under bunch of ones that she's next going to be equally concerned with or whatever, but that actually teaching has that same kind of affective thing. So that's really been a very powerful way of rethinking labor processes, because that's one of the other elements. One of the difficulties of the value-oriented thing is only to really look at the, the social form of the labor process and not its material content, yet the changes in the material content of labor processes, uh, which would be like in the agrarian case, the actual change in the labor process of agrarian work, which I have not done any work on. But and that's what that becomes a much, it's much easier to just write about value form than to actually do the history of how the actual labor processes are changing. And it does seem to me that that's actually one of the great contributions to late 20th century labor studies is the re-understanding of affective or emotional labor. Uh, care work is another. It's a few different words, each of which have their own connotation. On the other hand, one of the great tricks, because it's the same game that I see, every new metaphor not only allows us to see things, but actually excludes as much as it does. So one of the arguments of that work is service work is particularly uh, triggered by this kind of emotional or affective work. But it turns out if you actually do the counting, only about 20 or 30 percent of those people who are service workers are actually in that frontline customer. The hotel has a great hotel work. Rachel Sherman's wonderful book on uh, San Francisco hotels on front of the house and back of the house. And that lots of service work is manual labor without any affective labor because there's no contact with the client and to reread the entire of the service sector through emotional labor or affective labor is actually to give a misunderstanding of service work and the real divides and hierarchies which are raced and gendered inside service industries between those people who are in the front of the house doing the affective labor and those people in the back of the house doing the unaffective labor or whatever. So that's, I think, one of the intriguing things in that. 
On the other hand, this one I've never, I've tried to think this one through in a long time, and a former student of mine who is now at Carnegie Mellon, Kathy Newman, wrote a great book on radio where she tried to work this out, which is the idea that somehow our participation in the consumption of the media is itself a form of labor. And she did this on radio early on, that actually, that the commodity being sold on radio was the audience's attention. And that insofar as you were, that's what the advertisers wanted, and insofar as you were giving attention, your attention is a certain amount of your labor power, and that you're giving that attention to them that's what they were selling to the advertisers. They were selling your labor. They were a labor broker, in a way, selling your attention to that. And it does seem to me, um, and uh, that, and she worked that out on radio, because radio was one of those first places where inside the household, all of a sudden, people's attention was being... And I do think that, that the category of attention is an interesting one in that. Uh, as attention, particularly with a variety of forms of media, each fighting for our attention in that sense, and that attention is the expenditure of a certain amount of the time of living labor, if, if our living labor is really time in that sense, that we're not doing something else then even if it can't be turned into a value theory, exactly how does the uh, that, you know, contribute to the profits of those websites one way or another, which I think would be a kind of, that would be a mistaken way to try to figure out the mathematics of the digital housewife. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it's clear that a whole variety of the our involvements in medias from broadcast radio to the internet websites uh, and apps and all of that depend upon in some way mobilizing our attention. Uh, and I'd be really intrigued if there's others, if you find people that have thought this yeah, through in interesting also, uh, ways. Kathy Sherman thing sounds like a great... New, Newman. Newman. It, Newman's, okay, yeah. Newman. Uh. Um, yeah. So I wanted to ask about, um, so maybe return a little bit to the conversation at the very beginning and living labor <coughs> and metabolism because I didn't quite understand what you were saying. And so at the beginning of um, Wageless Life, you talk about how um, we need to decenter wage labor um, and our understanding of capitalism and begin from the imperative of making a living rather than from the assumption of wage labor. And so I wanted to know, like, what are the assumptions, like, what are, what does that mean for how we, like, go forward with social theory of theorizing life under capitalism? And also, like, do you, like, you mentioned the, at the end of the essay, you um, wrote, like, the Grundrasse which I haven't read yet. I've only read Capital. Um, and so I was wondering, like, what respect of uh, places do you see, like, a Marxist critique of capitalism as articulated in Capital as integral to, like, this, I don't know, new kind of, like, theorization of the imperative, like, to, like, starting from um, the imperative to make a living under capitalism instead of, instead of wage labor. And um, sort of, where are you with Marx now? Like, what, what do you think is like the most I don't know important concepts we should be taking out of Marx? What part of Marx should we like be reading in this this new kind of uh, theory of wageless life you're trying to create? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me answer that in two different ways. One is that is um, it, it may be that I, because of I, pop, my interest in popular culture, but I've always thought that. Theory at some part has to start with vernacular phrases. And I've always been struck by, at least in English, a distinction that you probably all know and would end, is the distinction between living and making a living. And that if you're at a cocktail party and says, what do you do? You know that that question is about how you make a living. And yet you know that somehow when you're making a living, you're not exactly living, 
uh, weekends and all that other time. And so I think this is that that is deeply uh, built into our vernacular way of understanding one of the fundamental divides. I call it work and daily life is one way, but in some sense I like the making a living and living. Uh, and even in teaching, that'll be the first one. And oddly enough, I think, uh, this is a larger kind of argument, none of the academic disciplines look at either living or making a living. Political science was invented to understand the state, Economics was invented to understand the economy. One can go on. I did, uh, Wallerstein has a wonderful account of the social sciences and how they divided up what it is. And that actually, if you look at all of the things they divided up, they looked at basically everything except living and making a living, which is why ordinary life falls out of so much academic work. Why Hannah Arendt was able to indeed say this is kind of inessential or secondary in even understanding the human condition philosophically or whatever. So that's kind of where I'm a little less and I worry about, not to put you on the spot on that one, uh, actually then trying to take biological metaphors into understanding Marxism. I don't think that that, that I think has been a mistake usually when it happens. I think they were skeptical of it. And so there's a way in which I do, th how I can write about how, and it's, and it's actually the scientists uh, in the Marxist biologists were very skeptical. They made lots of arguments about scale and how different histories work. Everything has a history. Uh, J. Uh, Haldane, J. B. S. Haldane, the great British geneticist, said, "You know, even the elements have a history." We live at such a time scale that we don't see that they change. But they do change or whatever. The solar system has a... But then there are all kinds of things that seem to us to be standing still because of the time frame that we live at. And at another scale, we seem to be standing still. But that sense... So for them, that's why I find Haldane's sense that one would have... That the whole universe works at different time scales. And so then it really becomes very tricky to move the analysis of history at the level of genes into the analysis of history at the level of human communities on this particular planet on Earth or whatever, let alone at a cosmic one or at the, the time frame of those, you know, radioactive particles, the quarks and whatever that one of my students was going off the CERN to study the, the Higgs boson or whatever, that, that it's uh, keeping those scales different or somewhat. So that... But the other one on the Marxism. So, this is, uh, why Marxism at all? So this is my Russian doll theory of Marxism, and which may be, this, that for better or worse, I guess, and maybe the one founding thing is, that the modern social movements that, that we still live in, in terms of emancipation, were more or less invented in the late 18th and early 19th century. The modern labor movements which came out of those new factories that Manchester did, the modern women's movement, it's not an accident that we go back to Wollstonecraft, to Seneca Falls in 1848, the modern movements against those empires, the anti-imperial movements, the modern movements against slavery, the abolitionist movement, and in roughly, so in some ways, I feel like we remain captured by the questions and contradictions of that set of modern social movements that emerged in the early 19th century. As a result of that, we do return in a different kind of way to the intellectuals of those social movements for thinking about it. It's not an accident that Wollstonecraft or Margaret Fuller or Marx's exact contemporary, born the same year, Frederick Douglass, who almost met Engel Engels because they were both tremendously influenced by the Chartists. I think they were in England at the same time. But 
Douglas was more interested in the moral force chartists, and Engels was a little more tied to the physical force chartists, so I don't think that Douglas and Engels ever met. But there is a kind of remarkable set of intellectuals that emerge at that point, and I again think that those figures and this is, this is sort of the way I teach the Marxism course, and that's, that's a second Russian doll. So inside the social movements, there are a set of theories of emancipation that we continue to return to. Not necessarily. You don't have to go out and read Wollstonecraft tomorrow. Or you don't have to go out and read Douglas tomorrow. But you're, if you just stay long enough, you're probably going to go back to them because the other figures will have been, are part of that dialogue. And for me, that generation of 1848, a remarkable generation of kind of revolutionary thought, is then, um, let's see if I can put it right, one of those, the new, all the new words are invented at that point. Uh, communism, socialism, anarchism, feminism, all emerge in those different various versions of it. Not all of them are socialist or whatever. One tradition, and for me, one returns to Marx and Engels because they're part of that. On the other hand, one peculiar reason why we may evolve is that that same generation, so that's true of all the social movement people. So if you're going to be in the social movements, you, I think, at some point are going to have to reckon with the questions that they put up. Maybe you're a Bakuninite and a Proudhonist or whatever. It doesn't have to be Marx or whatever. Uh, in, even in the U.S., you know, one of those traditions in the 1840s, just when the Lowell Mills are being made, Hawthorne is going off to a utopian community and writing Blythdale romance. Emerson and Fuller and Thoreau are writing a different kind of transcendental radicalism out of that, tied to Garrison. If one's an Americanist, one might move back to that. Uh, there's a whole set of young, young Bengal. Uh, emerges. There's a whole, it's around the world. 1848, this is one thing I did believe. You know, Wallerstein had this great essay where he says there's two world revolutions. And they both failed. And they both set the agenda for a century to come. 1848 and 1968. That's an interesting thing to think with in some kind of ways. And that I think we still live with that 1848. On top of that, the modern research university, which we are sitting inside of and continue to live, is invented at the University of Berlin in about 1815 or thereabouts. And that's one reason why we go back to Hegel and Humboldt and all those figures as well. Not that, so you don't have to, but if insofar as you inhabit the modern research university, we don't actually go back to the medieval universities, and most of us aren't reading that stuff in those ways, I think. Our world was really structured by that moment. And one of the curiosities and one reason why Marx and Engels have been, and that tradition has been a particularly important one, is because Marx is someone who comes out of both that new university as a young Hegelian with all of, unlike some of those others who are great political figures, but kind of wrote pamphlets and made speeches and were active in stuff, but didn't sit down and think, I have to do a scientific study of modern society. That was actually the university part of Marx that drove him to do that kind of research. And so the Marxist tradition has often been one of those places at the intersection of modern research, humanistic, social, and scientific, and the social movements. So for me, there's no in particular part. I followed most of students. I would say you should follow students. When I was teaching capital, and one student said to me, this is some years ago, it was in the middle of the anti-sweatshop stuff, wow! There's so much stuff about child labor and capital. I want to write a paper on child labor and capital. I went, you know how many thousands of books have been written about Marx in the last hundred years? Nobody had written about child labor and capital. I couldn't find any, maybe here or there, but to actually take that particular issue? 
She went there. She saw it because she was working in the whole anti-sweatshop thing at that moment. She saw it. So it's really about going back and seeing. I feel that here. It's like, oh, well, I'm trying to think about genes and cells and uh, what's the, the book that's actually all on kind of uh, cell production in... Uh, just came out a couple of years ago. I forget it. Everything's going out of my mind. <laughs> and then also all of a sudden, wow, a whole dialogue about cells in Marx that I never knew. And until I, I first had to read the history of biology and find out who were the guys, Schleiden and uh, Schweik and Schleiden, I'd never heard of them before, and I'm reading their book on cells and why they're thinking about it, and then discovering, wow, they're coming out of that same research university, they're part of that same debate, and a different kind of Marx is there. One of the richnesses, and then we have the other thing, which I would say, so these are why I've, I return to Marx. The other thing is, most social movement activists don't have their papers saved. Marx had both the uh, advantage and disadvantage of having a powerful state adopt that work as a kind of nat national ideology. And so as a result, there's 50 volumes of Marx writings that have been collected and letters. And so it's a remarkable resource that's not there as much. There's been a few others. Uh, the Yale for many years put together the Douglas Papers to try to give the kind of, you know, this is what official intellectuals always had. You know, those horrible books that are out there, four volumes on some political scientists at Yale from the 1880s that no one would want to ever read again, but because they were official. But, you know, to put together the Douglas Papers, all of those little speeches, articles written sometimes without even a name on it in the black newspapers of the 1840s and 1850s, to bring that together and turn it into a collected works? Du Bois, we still don't have that, let alone, and for the women intellectuals of these social movements, that's barely gone. Fuller's now got a couple of good biographies out about her, but, you know, we're still... And so, in some sense, for me, Marx stands in for our responsibility to the intellectual history of the social movements. And that was a particular one. So, it's, uh, that's why I would, you know, read it as it, it interests you. That Don't feel you have to read any of it. I came out of a generation, none of us read Capital. We had been electrified by a generation that had found the young Marx, the 1844 manuscripts. I read all of those, alienation, the difference between alienation and objectification, did all of that kind of stuff, praxis, all of that, and then went on and didn't really read that Marx. I, you know, for me, Marxism was Lukash and Gramsci and Benjamin and Adorno and that whole Hegelian thing. It's much later that all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe I should read Capital and saw, wow, this was interesting. Partly it had to be with after 1989, after the block of the Soviet Union, after that sense that kind of it had been solidified into this. That made it new again. And all of a sudden, in them moments where, in fact, the old Hegelian thing became more solidified to me. Do I really have to teach all of this kind of philosophical vocabulary in order to understand this tradition? When, in fact, none of that is in Engels's condition of the working class, which seemed to me electrifying account of the world, you know, read it right now. It's true, it's Manchester in 1840, but it could be any number of cities around the world right now with these changes. So in part, it's about seeing different ones, uh, different Marxists. Well, it's, uh, it's noon, uh, so... Uh, you know, our, our time is, uh, I mean, I don't want to force the discussion, but. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, my friend. No, thank, thank you, you all. So much. Sorry. 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 Sorry.